Welcome, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to share some of my material with you today. Um, I'm a uh, full-time periodontist in Connecticut, and I've been teaching for the last, oh, 35, 36 years at NYU and University of Connecticut. I see some of my residents and former students here, so I'm glad that you're all here. And what, today, what I'd like to do today is share some of my experience with uh, bone regeneration over the last 30 years of doing regeneration. Um, and talk to you about some of the techniques, both around teeth and with dental implants. A lot of the things that I'll be talking about are similar to what Bobby Horowitz was talking about as well. So we share some of the same concepts. Uh, it's my email up there. If you have any questions, you can email me and I'll be happy to share this presentation with you if you'd like. But before I go on with a little shameless self-promotion, I have a book coming out and it should be out in about three weeks. And this has been my life's passion. It was my COVID project. It's called Treating People, Not Patients. And it's all about bringing hospitality to medicine and dentistry. And I think that without that kind of relationship that we have with patients, that we can't get to do some of the cool things that we are talking about today. Without the relationship, you don't get to do the treatment. And it all starts right there. And also, good, having good relationships helps people heal better. And, um, the, one of the last slides of the presentation, I'll give you a copy of my uh, first chapter, both in audio and, and PDF. So this is a um, triangle that a lot of us have seen. It's a famous regeneration triangle or triad. Sam Lynch wrote this in his book in 2008. And for regeneration, whatever, what regeneration means is if you remake something that has been lost, it could be soft tissue, hard tissue, muscle, nerve, which is very difficult. But for regeneration to happen, you need three things. You need living cells. Someone has to be healthy. They gotta be alive. Now we do a lot of teaching, you know, uh, cadavers. I take my residents down every, every year to a cadaver workshop. We spend one day. And some of my residents are really good surgeons. They do some beautiful bone grafting. But I've yet to go back and look at any of those cadavers six years later and see any bone after they've done the graft because there are no cells. You need live human being for that to happen. So our graft does not create cells. What the graft is, is a scaffold. It's a scaffold for which cells, living cells, can grow across. And then we have growth factors, which are signaling molecules. You don't need growth factors for a graft to work. They're, they're endogenous, they're in the body. But we do add growth factors. Bioexclude is, has growth factors in it. There are many other growth factors that we can purchase and buy. You know, recombinant PRGF, bone morphogenic protein, and then they're the ones that are in the body. MDO games, another one that we can purchase. So they sort of supercharge our grafts. They don't cause the graft to regenerate, but they speed things up. Are they necessary? Do you need PRF? Do you need PRP? You know, I'm not going to comment on that, but they may help a little bit. They'll decrease inflammation, but you're still going to get healing even without that. So when you're doing a bone graft or any sort of regeneration, you know, mostly bone, you have a choice, like what kind of bone do you want to use? And there are many different options. You know, there are hundreds. You'll see that on the, on the floor, the exhibit floor pretty soon. There'll be many different types of grafts that are there. Allograft, xenograft, synthetics, and of course, autogenous bone. And then there are different types of membranes that we can use. And there are different types of growth factors. You know, there are more choices in bone grafting than there are at Starbucks. And if you look at Starbucks, you have 68,000 choices of what to drink there. I would never be able to be a barista because I have to do what the customer wants. When I'm doing bone grafting, I don't have to do what my patient wants because my patient doesn't really want to graft, do they? They want to look better. They want to feel better. They want to be healthier. They want to have a nice smile. They don't know anything about a graft. So it's really not up to them. It's up to me because I have the expertise because I've been doing this for a period of time. So with the different types of grafts we have, we all have autogenous, we have allograft, xenograft, and synthetics. Uh, in our practice, most of the regeneration that we do are used with probably allografts and some autogenous bone. I don't use any xenograft in practice, almost none. So the most popular xenograft would be BIOS. I use very little BIOS. I actually, and, and I don't use any. I have, and I don't use it because it sort of sits there, and I know you people get great regeneration with it, and there's plenty of literature on it. But in our practice, I use the allograft, and I get good results with that. I don't feel I need to add the xenograft although a lot of people do and have good results. So what I'm gonna share with you today is not the way to do it, it's just the way I've been doing it to get the results that I'm gonna show you. 
because everybody does it differently. I just read an article on antibiotics and, and periodontics and general periodontology, and I think there are like 500 different protocols for antibiotic therapy. Nobody's, I mean, there's more protocols for graft therapy, that's for sure. And membranes, there are even more choices. We have, again, this, this, the four categories, autologous, patient's own blood. I don't know if this is a membrane, but some people say it is, PRP, PRF. Eduardo Onichua from Spain talked about it being a membrane. I don't think really the patient's own blood spun down is a very good membrane. It doesn't stay very long. The allografts, you have pericardium. Get that human pericardium. Uh, we use that in our practice. There's placental membranes, bioexclude, acellular, dermal matrix, made by various companies. And then we have synthetics, you know, different types of synthetic membranes. You know, the old Gore-Tex was the standard synthetic. It's not made anymore. Uh, and then we have titanium mesh, which a lot of people use. And then, you know, guide or epiguide. And, and then the, the ones from animals are bovine and porcine. And these are probably the most common. Most people use bovine membranes. When I started doing regeneration, uh, we didn't have resorbables. We only had non-resorbables. I started with Gore-Tex back in the uh, late 80s and they were difficult to use. Those of you who've been around for a while realized you know, that was our only choice. Now we have many different choices. And for growth factors, we have platelet-rich, platelet-rich fibrin, PRP, PRF. I can't keep them all straight, but they're pretty much a spin off a patient's own blood and taking out, the, taking out the white blood cells and the red blood cells and utilizing some growth factors. The allograph would be the placental membrane, and synthetics would be, you know, GEM20 roundly common P, uh, PDGF, and, infused, which is bone morphogenic protein, and then you have endo game, which we all know as periodontists. So that's the, that's the host of what we have. And these are our choices, you know. And if you look at the different variations of type choices that we have, we have thousands, probably millions of different choices that we have. If you put that together, all the permutations of these graphs, there are millions of different options that we have, and that's why it's so confusing, and that's why we have all these different rooms and all these different products and all these different hosts that are showing different ways of doing things. One of the things that I'm proud of is what I do is not that hard. So I went, became a periodontist, because um, I graduated dental school in 1979, and back then, I, you know, the choice was, you know, I could do restorative dentistry, ortho, paro, endo. I became a periodontist because you didn't have to have good hands. All you had to do was, you know, do some scaling, root planning, flap it, put it back, everything heals in the mouth, right? And then they came out with connective tissue grafts and root coverage, I go, oh boy. You know, and then bone regeneration. We didn't do any bone grafts when I was a resident. I mean, we just did a little autogenous. And then we had to do that. And then implants came along, and now they can take an x-ray of my work and see if it's good or bad. So now everyone knows that I don't have good hands, because you just take an x-ray and look at my work. So my brother-in-law was an orthodontist. He used to call me a gum gardener, and he made fun of me all the time for becoming a periodontist. But it's changed a lot in the last 35, 40 years that I've been practicing. I've been actually out of school for uh, over 40 years. And you know, I'm one of those old guys that I used to look at when I came to the meetings. When I first came to the meeting, I was talking to some of my friends here. I used to walk in the meeting, I see Bob Schauhorn give Bill Becker, you know, a, a, a big hug, and you know, Bert Langer, who first time I met Bert, I was telling Bobby Butler about this earlier, my hands were cold and clammy. Now, if I see a movie star like Brad Pitt or something, I go, hey Brad, how you doing? But if I see a famous periodontist, I get nervous. So I was nervous when I first met Bert Langer. And I just gave him a, a hello in the hall. And it's, you know, now, now he's older, and so am I. And I see some younger people here. And uh, that's the way it works. That's a good way it works. I didn't design it. So we're gonna talk about two things today. We're gonna talk about GTR and GBR. GTR is guided tissue regeneration, and that was developed by a periodontist, Stu Neiman, from the Altebottle, Sweden. You know, he published that famous article, I think it was 1981, with a little membrane around a tooth, and it grew some bone vertically. And uh, instead of with a little really poor filter in the lab, and that's what started. And then Jan Gottlow started developing it and others early in the 80s. And I actually took one of my first classes from Jan Gottlow and a guy named Jerry Kramer, who probably nobody knows anymore except some of the older people. And that was cool. That's how we started doing it. So let me share with you a little bit of GTR. And this is the, actually it's 1982. This is the original article where they placed the membrane between the soft tissue and bone. And it was the first, one of the first forms of tissue engineering in dentistry. And it was started by a periodontist. And what it does is it handicaps the soft tissue. Soft tissue grows faster than bone, as we all know. It grows at about a millimeter a day or thereabouts. And bone grows maybe a millimeter a month. I'm not sure if those numbers are accurate. But we just know soft tissue heals faster. 
If you have sutures in, when do you take the sutures out? A week, two weeks. You break your arm, cast days on for what? Two months, six weeks. But the bone's still not healed. Bone, complete healing of bone takes almost a year for it to turn over and turn over. So bone is a slow grower. So we want to give it as all the help we can. And that's why we use the membrane, because it makes a compartment, two compartments, one for soft tissue, one for hard tissue. And this is the original guided tissue regeneration. And there are six tissues involved with guided tissue regeneration. You have the bone, you have the periodontal ligament, you have connective tissue, you have epithelium, and then you have dentin and cementum. And it's an open system, so bacteria can get in here. Guided tissue regeneration is harder than guided bone regeneration. With guided bone regeneration, you only have three tissues. You have soft tissue, epithelium, connective tissue, bone. And usually, it's a closed system. So this is easier. Guided bone regeneration should be easier than guided tissue regeneration. It's most difficult to regenerate here. So this is a tough case where it's the anterior part of the mouth. We have about a seven or eight millimeter pocket on the mesial of the lateral incisor. You already have papillary loss. If that tooth comes out, what do you do? You can do a ridge augmentation and maybe an implant, but you know where the bone is here. We're not gonna be able to get the bone to come up to here. That's impossible or very difficult. I certainly can't do that. You could do orthodontics and be very complicated about it. Maybe you need endo, and then you need more restorations to pull this thing down. You could do a bridge, but you're gonna lose all this. You can try to regenerate this. So all the options, this case we can talk about residency program for a long period of time. There are many different options. So when I see this patient, I have to inform her. I said, you know, you're probably gonna have an aesthetic defect. I can try to regenerate some of the bone in that area, but I can't guarantee we're gonna get any more bone. And we may actually have an aesthetic problem. But first, I wanna to try to save the tooth. You know, we're saving more teeth now. You know, the pendulum always swings back and forth, right? You're know, going through that in the United States and in the world right now, the pendulum's swinging one way politically, it'll come back the other way, you know, back and forth, you know. It's that way in dentistry. So whatever people are talking about up here, don't believe them, they're gonna be talking about something differently in 10 years. So I don't know if that's completely true, but the pendulum right now, and I'm happy for it, is swinging towards saving teeth among people who do a lot of restorative dentistry. Not everybody wants to save teeth. A lot of people are taking out a lot of teeth. And as P.D. Miller, one of my mentors, says, more teeth are lost to titanium than to periodontal disease. It's a famous quote of his. And um, I don't know if he's right or not, because I have no data for that, but I do, we, we do take out a lot of teeth. Does this can be savable? It might be savable. So let's give it a shot. And this is how my technique is. Notice that this calculus down here, and I noticed that um, Bob Horowitz quote is Thombau before, before I got up here. And you, can't, you cannot get down very far scaling root plane, maybe four millimeters, maybe five. But you know, your curette may get down this far, but this may feel smooth. If you're doing this blind, you may think that you have all the calculus. There. And oftentimes when you're, when you're scaling blind, which you can do with laser procedures, you may not know if you have all the calculus out. I like good visualization. But if I get good visualization, that means I have to pull up a flap and then I make up more recession. So there's always this balance. Do I lay a flap so I can see or do I, I just feel that it's completely gone because it doesn't, because tactically it's smooth. And this felt smooth to me after scaling and root playing. And I did the scaling on that patient. But she still had a pocket and it wasn't healthy. So I laid a flap and we made an incision, well, you know, one tooth distal, but I don't touch this papilla. I try to touch as little papillas as possible when I'm going into that area. So we lay an incision, we come in here, it's a palatal approach, which was described years ago by Frisch, but modified by others, including myself. Uh, in, a, in a article I published a few years ago in a palatal approach to anterior, saving the anterior teeth, and we get into this vertical defect. And then we're not gonna get regeneration up to here, it just doesn't happen, because we don't have a blood supply up here, we don't have a periodontal ligament. But perhaps we can fill this defect, this little defect. So what do we do, what's our treatment plan? We clean it, uh, we have about a seven millimeter defect into that area, it's a three wall defect at the base, then it becomes a two wall, then a one wall. So the base of that is going to fill I'm not gonna get bone completely across, but I'm gonna give it a shot. Um, I use tetracycline or minocycline in here. I can't tell you that I need to use that, but I just do use it. I use it for a number of reasons. It removes the smear layer, it kills bacteria. Maybe it prevents epithelialization. I don't know, but I do use it. And I've been doing it for 35 years. It's just one of those habits. I can't I tell you, it's, you have to do it, but I just do it. And I leave that in there for a couple minutes. We place our cancellous bone graft here. I use, I use this was mixed with endogame, and I place bioexclude across. Sometimes I use endogame, sometimes I won't, but I always use bioexclude. And this has been a real game changer for me in regeneration. I didn't think I could do this routinely, but I'm gonna show you a few cases, and you can see that we get pretty good regeneration. Now the closures like this, there's a vertical here. This is all closed with 5-0 gut um, with a P3 needle. 
And I try to use uh, resorbable sutures in my verticals because of the alveolar mucosa, it heals so quickly. And in a week, you're almost not gonna see a scar into that area. So these are all the growth factors that we can use. I talked about autographs that you can use. You can buy BioExclude, you can buy GEM21. It just was sold, I said, to Geislich yesterday. Uh, you have Infuse, you have Endogame. Um, very rarely use Infuse. It's expensive, and I don't know how great it is. GEM21, I do use in a lot of the graph materials that I use. I don't use uh, autogenous growth factors anymore, except that's in the patient's own blood. Um, uh, Endogame, sometimes, sometimes. But the ones I use mostly are probably GEM and BioExclude, sometimes together, sometimes not. And I pretty much use the Endogame because it serves as a carrier. Now, the amnion chorion membrane, which is what BioExclude is, is, is made from, is taken from the placenta. And there are the chorion layer, which is fibroblast based membrane, is the amnion epithelial based membrane compact layer and fibroblast. And what it's done is it's separated. And it's separated, here's a little diagram, here's a little diagram taken from the country, because from the company, it's separated and fused together that you just have the amnion and the chorion layer. Now, it doesn't have any specificity, the membrane. You can place it on the right, right side up or the right side down. I don't even know which side it is. It just serves mostly, and I, in my opinion, not as mostly as a membrane or as a barrier, although some people from the company may feel a little differently, but it serves mostly as a growth factor. And there are hundreds of different growth factors that are in this, in this, mem in this membrane. And what I've found, especially in this technique, I get very good regeneration. So here's the before, and this is about six years later. Now, is this regeneration? Well, there's more bone on x-ray, but you can, change the, you can change the darkness of the x-ray, and it looks like you have more bone growth. But when I probe here, I'm probing seven millimeters, and now I'm probing two, and it looks pretty good. There's not a, there's not a lot of recession in that area, and we're able to save, the, save this tooth for this patient. So let's look at a case that's a little bit more dramatic. In this case here, um, what we're looking at is an anterior defect, and we see a lot of these. Why does she have so much periodontal disease here? I'm not really sure. She does have generalized periodontal disease, but this is a very, very large defect. I'm gonna show it to you in a second. Again, our approach for this type of defect is going to be a palatal approach, and when we expose that, we can see that we have, oh, maybe about 12 millimeters of bone loss into proximity. There's a little bit of bone still left on the mesial of tooth number eight. Tooth number nine has complete bone loss. We place some cancellous bone into that area after we clean it, and scale it and root plane it, and you can place an antibiotic up there, or you can place EDTA, some people do, or nothing. I mean, I talk to a lot of people that do nothing. I don't think the data says that it's that important to put something up there, but my thing is tetracycline, or now minocycline. And then we place the bioexclude membrane. Now this membrane, I used to cut it and try to fit it, and I used to spend hours trying to get this thing in there. But, because I used to treat it like a Gore-Tex membrane or some of the other types of membranes, some of the bovines. What I do now is I just place it up there and I let it get wet or, from, or I let the, 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 the blood loosen it up. And it goes in like a stiff piece of cellophane and then it becomes like a wet noodle and you can just push it through this area. So I don't cut it at all anymore. I just place it up there and I push it into that area. And I'll do that with the back of a, you know, a, a blunt instrument um, I'd be careful with gauze because it can pull it right out of that area. Once that's in place, I'm done. I'm done with the graft and I just have to close it. So what does bioexclude? It's a human placental membrane. You know, it is from humans, so you have to tell your patients that. It's been around for a while. It's been used in ophthalmology, dermatology, dental wounds, spine sports. What's nice is it's antibacterial, so if it becomes exposed, you don't get a lot of bacteria into that area. There's been a, actually, there was a, um, a, um, a presentation at last year's AAP that talked about that accelerates the healing. The reason that I use it is for healing acceleration, and I seem to get better bone regeneration when I do use it. And I have been using this membrane for, I was an early adopter of this, but I didn't use it a lot until I started to look at my cases. So in my practice, um, I, don't do, I don't do any clinical research. I have a few cases going on, but that's not what we do. I try to figure out what works. Most of my research is done by photographing my cases and looking at them long term. And over a period of time, I started to see I was getting pretty good regeneration with this material. And it has a lot of other privileged immunological factors in it, cytokines and growth factors and things like that, and probably close to 200 have been, have been, been written about that are in this membrane. But I'm not an immunologist, I'm not a scientist, I just know that this works, I'm a clinician. When we close it, we close it from the, from the palate. I ended up making one vertical incision here. You always make your verticals interradicularly, never over the teeth. Uh, because you don't want to get any recession. And I close this up with a contamination of 5-0 gut and Gore-Tex sutures, most of the time keeping my knots to the palate. 
So it's basically a palatal approach, as described you know, years ago by Frisch. And, um, and we also republished that article in 2018, 30-year follow-up. So here's the case at one year. And what, what I find with these cases is that they mature over a period of time. Then the most important thing that we do in dentistry is not this surgery, but get, teaching patients how to brush and floss. This patient did not know how to brush and floss. Matter of fact, all of our patients, and I think, Bob, you noticed, we do a Butler index on every one of our patients in our practice. And it's a very simple index. You know, you just look at five teeth, and you look at, uh, you know, four surfaces, and you can get, the, you get 20 areas to look at, and you try to get them down to as low as numbers as possible, with plaque. So our hygienists are instructed to do this on every, on every patient. So here we are at four years, looks pretty good, and the hygiene is good. This patient takes good care of himself. Here we are at seven years. Now, we didn't get complete regeneration, but it doesn't probe, and we kept the tooth and mouth. Now, if I want that to look better, I could do ortho, I can do some restorative dentistry, and probably we can get this papilla to come back you know, completely. But here we are, a seven-year follow-up. Here's our initial. This probe is you know, down about 14 millimeters. Here, the probe is probing about two. So if we, with the 14 is from about here, that would be about here. So how much regeneration did we get? I don't know, because I haven't opened it up but it looks like about seven millimeters of regeneration for this tooth. Now, if we look at some of the more difficult cases uh, where we're dealing with furcations, and this is a 70-year-old man, but he's a triathlete, keeps himself in phenomenal shape, he came in and he said he wanted to save the tooth. I said, this is a non-savable tooth. This is not predictable. But you know, we look at all these non-predictable cases that if you look at the literature, most often teeth just don't fly out. You get someone on a three-month recall, get them to come in every three months, do some brushing and flossing, whether you treat them or not with surgery, most of those teeth hang in there pretty well. Most people lose their teeth because they're not keeping them clean and because it's not being deplacked by professionals. This is a tooth that I don't think it would say would be kept that much longer because we have a class two frication. It wasn't class three, it was class two, but it was right down to close to the apex. And, but I checked the tooth, it did, need not, it did not need endodontic therapy. So we treated that with tetracycline, with purpurose and endogame into that area, and then we covered it with bioexclude. We placed a big bioexclude membrane on top of that area, and we closed it up. We come back a few, a few months later, and this patient is now probing two millimeters. We still have a frication of class two, but we've regenerated this part of the bone down here. The patient doesn't probe 14 millimeters anymore. This is it probing initially seven, and now it probes one. Now part of that decrease in probing depth is because we have some recession because everything has moved apically. But we maintain this tooth, and this is about seven, eight years ago. These are the kind of cases that we see most frequently, these two or three wall defects between bicuspids that we see for some reason, maybe there's some calculus in here, maybe there's some cement underneath this crown. We have an isolated defect. And what we do very simply with these is we'll make a sulcular incision. I don't remove this papilla. I come right across it so I have access to that. If I don't have to make it vertical, I don't want to. And you can see we probe nine millimeters. We'll degranulate it, clean it out, place tetracycline, and the same, same technique. And we come back a few years later, and here we're probing very deeply, maybe about nine, and here we're probing two, and you can see the difference in the bone density into that area. I didn't re-enter the cases, because I don't re-enter these unless there's a reason to, but I don't need to, because they're not probing, and they seem to hold up very nicely. The last case I'll show you is a uh, happened uh, post-ortho. This happens to be a dental assistant that worked for the orthodontist, but did not see me until the ortho was completed. And teeth were moved that were inflamed. She had some periodontal disease. You can see we have an early frication involvement here. But for whatever reason, she ended up probing nine millimeters distal to the, the canine. And for this, I don't want to get recession in this area. So in the anterior part of the mouth, I will always make a palatal approach and push that papilla toward the buckle. And it's maybe similar to a mist technique described by um, the guy from Italy, whose name I can't remember at the moment. Um, but anyway, we have a defect here. Here's our tetracycline into that area. Probing right here about seven, eight millimeters. You can see a through and through defect. But this is the papilla. The papilla that was pushed from the palate. I don't want to do a suit, uh, much of a, I don't want to remove this papilla because I want that to come back. Here's our, here's our defect filled, bioexclude, and we closed it across in this area. So this papilla is placed back into the intracircular region, and here we are with the six millimeter vertical gain a few years later, and that's been stable. So with teeth, you know, I feel fortunate we're able to save a lot more teeth than we, we used to with this technique. And this is our technique. This is the only technique I use for bone grafting around teeth when I'm trying to save it. 
And I've been doing this for about nine years, and I have tremendous confidence. Now, I use endogame in there. I'm not sure, sure I need the endogame. I do need the bioexclude. I've used other membranes. I've cut up other types of bovine membranes. I've used Gore-Tex membranes. Very difficult. I could show you some of them old Gore-Tex cases. They do work, but then you've got to go remove it. Removing Gore-Tex or cytoplast or Teflon membranes is difficult to do, and it adds another bit of morbidity to the patient. Now, let's switch gears now. We're going to talk for the rest of the time that we have together uh, about dental implants. And for implants to be successful, and this is a little diagram that my uh, co-author, Debbie Wong, and I uh, came together with before I gave a lecture at the Academy of Periodontology back in about 2008. I was giving a lecture with Stu Fromm, and I was supposed to lecture on vertical, uh, horizontal augmentation. I put together all these beautiful cases. I'm showing it to Debbie. Now, Debbie's one of the smartest people I've ever met, and she just has like this photographic memory. I show her my case, and she goes, all right. I go, what do you mean? She goes, all right. What are you showing? I go, I'm just, she goes, what's the lecture about? So it was just like befores and afters, and it was nothing. So it literally, this is those napkin conversations. In about 90 seconds, she wrote, for implants to be successful, they have to be stable, and they have to be in a good restorative position. And for them to be stable, you need bone quantity and quality, and you need these four things for a good restorative position. It was pretty funny. And we ended up writing a book chapter about it in our book. But the, if you can see, the most important factor is bone. And as my mentor, Dennis Tarnow, says, no bone, no implant. And no bone, no teeth. You know, you do need bone. Bone's important. So let's talk about GBR and how we regenerate bone. But first, before I talk about GBR, let me talk about extractions and what do I do for handling extractions. Now, there are three types of defects, or, de or if you've read another, maybe four or maybe five. Everyone keeps on rewriting all these things because we have nothing else to do because we're periodontists and we work in this little area like this in a dark hole that's wet in the back of the bun. And then this is the reason that I lecture because I got to get out of that little dark hole there. You know, to show you these pictures, I had to work in that dark hole like all you do. It's, it's hard. It's hard work. And I um, can't believe I've done it for so long. But I love it. You know, I, I like doing it. It's fun. And, um, and I like to regenerate the bone, which is always a challenge. So there's four types, three types of uh, sockets. Type one, we have bone and soft tissue. Type two, where you're missing some bone, but you still have the soft tissue. And type three, we're gonna talk about type two sockets. So, another algorithm. The buccal or lingual, could be buccal, lingual, or palatal plate, is either present or not present. So when I'm taking out a tooth, I'll take out the tooth and I'll see if the plate's present. Because that's gonna determine what I do for the bone regeneration. If it's present, it's relatively simple. We'll do it flapless, perhaps a graft, and we'll place a collagen plug with or without a membrane, which I'll place maybe with a tunnel. If it is no plate, it becomes more complex. We may have to flap or tunnel, place a membrane, and place a collagen plug. So for every, every defect that doesn't have a plate, a membrane is gonna be placed. Now I also use membranes a lot when there is a plate present in the anterior zone because the bone is so thin in the anterior maxilla, it's less than a millimeter, that tends to resorb because you take out the tooth and the periodontal ligament, it's lost part of its blood supply, and you only have blood supply from the from the labial. So oftentimes you will lose some of that bone even with just the bone graft. So that's why I place a membrane. I don't have data for that, but I have seen it clinically. So if we've lost the buccal plate, I recommend the membrane. So in this patient right here, this patient is going to lose both of these teeth because they're failing endodontically. One is fractured, and I'm not going to try to regenerate bone around one that I think I can save, so I'm taking them both out. One of the more challenging types of defects, and I've yet to do one of these perfectly yet. I've seen one or two cases published that are, perfect, that are done perfectly, but multiple, multiple surgeries, um, and it takes quite a bit. You know, we were at the Perioplastic Study Club yesterday, and I saw some beautiful work, but sometimes I'm thinking, like, do I want to put a patient through three years of treatment and all these surgeries just to make it perfect? It's, well, maybe you do. It, that that's becomes a judgment call. But, there, but these are difficult cases to do. And you can see that this patient will probe you know, right to the hub of the, of, of the uh, periodontal probe. This probe is about 11 millimeters in that area. This is where the defect goes to. There's no bone between any of those teeth. And they don't have a very good prognosis. And you can see we've lost the bone. So this actually is a very relatively easy or straightforward to, to regenerate. Now, I've seen all sorts of things. I see a lot of my good friends using titanium mesh to go into there. I use that, not anymore, it's too much work. Okay, you all are in practice. Do you wanna have stress during your day? 
I mean, do you really want to have like membranes exposed, have to get the titanium mesh out? Well, it only has an exposure rate of 15% or 12%. Yeah, that's only 12%. When well, you treat 100 patients, that's 12 patients. What are you going to do? Do you want to take your time dealing with all that problem, talking to them? It's complicated. Yeah, you can get beautiful results. I've gotten some very good results with it, but it's too much work. What I want to show you today is to make it easy. So I always talk about, I talk about this all the time. There are always two things I look at. Is it leading to more stress or less stress? Am I becoming more effective or less effective? I want to be more effective and less stressed. That's my life's work. So why do I do this for a living? I, I don't know, wired. But in clinic, we have enough problems when things go right. You know, you all know that, those five patients, right? You know the five patients, the ones that never, things didn't go well? You know, we all have them. Okay, so we packed that with bone after we degranulate. But let me just make one more point. Really important to degranulate. You can't really degranulate well oftentimes unless you lay a flap, especially if you have buccal bone loss. I do a little, try this at home. Next time you take out a tooth, buccal bone loss, take out the tooth, degranulate it, and when you think you got all the soft tissue out, lay a flap. You'll be surprised at how much soft tissue you oftentimes will leave. So I want to get in here and clean. I do this with high-speed finishing burrs, Neumeyer burrs, place puros with cancellus, uh, cancellus, small particle size, bioexclude membrane over that area, I place another membrane just around that, and I make a sling suture. So we pick up this papilla, we come around, and we tie this. I fill this with collagen, I close. No primary closure. I never want primary closure for these sites. Now, a lot of people do want primary closure, but you're going to start to distort the vestibule. And if you distort the vestibule, then you've got to go back, and you've got to put it back in the right position. And then you have to do a soft tissue graft or, 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 or another mucogingival procedure. And this way, I won't have to. As a matter of fact, I'll increase the keratinized tissue. I also cover this with cyanoacrylate. So here's our bone regeneration at about four months. I usually don't go into these sites for about eight months. I want to wait, I'm waiting longer. I've heard, I was talking to somebody yesterday, I don't remember who it was, and they said they're going in at four months. And actually it was Rodrigo Neva. He said that he goes in at four months. I go, I'm waiting eight. He says, well, I want to stimulate the bone again. I go, yeah, but it still takes a while to turn over. And this is not completely mature bone into that area. So here we, here's how we started. Here we're, we were at four months, the implants go in. And I will drill at slow speed. I'm drilling at 75 RPM. This is autogenous bone I'll place over there, perhaps with another, some more puros. And then I always use these, these bioexclude membranes at implant surgery when I'm doing a contour graft. Now, this is probably enough bone. I mean, if you look at the literature, you want about two millimeters of bone. But in the anterior maxilla, I tend to be a bone pig. I want as much bone as possible. I want to really regenerate that. So I'll place more bone there as possible. Here's the patient in provisional, soft tissue's looking good, but you can see we're not gonna get our papillas back. Uh, I can't get the papillas back between two adjacent implants, and I talked to the patient about that before, but that looks pretty good, that looks pretty good. And here's our final restoration, two implants. We lost the papilla here, we maintain this one, maintain this one, because we still have the patient's teeth and they're periodontally healthy, and he's happy with the final result. Now, this case here, I'm very proud of this case because the local oral surgeon Saw the patient, told him to take a tooth, do a three unit bridge, and went back to his dentist and he says, he goes, well, get a second opinion. So he came over to see me for a second opinion, and this is challenging, but it certainly is possible. When you take out a tooth and the plate is completely gone to the apex of the tooth, there's not a lot of blood supply in this area. But notice that I'm not making a big flap. Now, I've, I've trained with some surgeons that make really big flaps to do large rehabilitations, but I don't think you have to make it that big because I don't want to distort the blood supply and I don't want to cause recession on the adjacent teeth. But I do make verticals. I do a lot of verticals in the anterior maxilla. I'll make a vertical interproximally at a right angle, degranulate that very well, place in here, puros, in this case it had gem in it, and bioexclude into that area, and the membrane. This is, a, this is an osteoguard membrane, it was a bovine membrane, but almost any membrane will work into that area. Collagen plug, cyanoacrylate, and there's my surgery. It doesn't take me that long to do. This may take me 30 minutes or so and we'll let the patient heal. This is one week follow-up, looks pretty good at one week. Here we are at seven months, complete regeneration of the bone, and now it's a simple implant procedure. Could I do this as an immediate? I couldn't, but I mean, there's, you know, there's this one guy that's 
in another country I'm not going to mention, he'll take the back of the tuberosity and place the implant in it and that all at the same time, which looks good on the podium, but it doesn't look so good if it fails. And I want to decrease my failure rate. Now, I know that if you look at the literature, you'll see there's really no difference between immediate and delayed, but I can find literature to show you that there is a difference between immediate and delayed. And I know my office is a difference. I get a better result when I regenerate bone first. And it allows me another opportunity to place the implant in an ideal position and place bone around that if I want to augment that even further. So here we are at seven months. I'll place the implant into that area, and then I'm going to wait another probably four months. I do use stents for almost all my implant procedures. Um, I know guide, if you look at the literature, guide it works better than non-guide in terms of accuracy, but you know, you know, okay, let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me address that right now. Let me address the elephant in the room. Do you remember the guy that landed the plane on the Hudson River? Remember Sully, okay? If he did guided plane landing, they'd be, all be dead. Okay, they told him to go back to Teterboro. They weren't gonna make it. So he made a decision. So I'm Sully. <laughs> I wanna save my patients. I do guided. You know, I also play Frisbee. Frisbee costs what, 10 bucks? A guide, 500. They're $500 Frisbees in my hands. Now I've tried. I wrote one of the original articles comparing cone beam CT scans to periapicals. It was like 30 years old, I wrote that with Bob Fiella and James Abrahams, a, a, an MD. And I've tried to do guided, I'm just too old to get it. All right, I'm working on Instagram, but I'll probably get Instagram before guided. All right, so here's the final restoration. There's the tooth, we've got good bone regeneration, we're able to save it. Let's talk a little bit about ridge augmentation. I'm just gonna show you a simple case. This is what I'm, I do a lot. I'll drill this site here, take the autogenous bone from here, place it labially, and then place just a bioexclude membrane. I usually perforate the bone there before I place that to open up some of the capillaries in the bone and get it, because this is, you know, Cortical bone doesn't have much of a blood supply. I'll place that in there, I come back and I get this kind of bone around it. Simple, relatively simple thing to do. So I use BioExclude around implant placement at the time of implant placement. I use it for, for bone regeneration. I use it for large ridge augmentations. This is a relatively large ridge augmentation. We did a ridge augmentation in the mandible and did a little hybrid here, single implant here. And she is uh, going to be losing all these teeth. So we took all those teeth out and this is what she looks like. And I placed a couple of tenting screws. Now, a lot of people might do this with block grafting, with titanium mesh. Um, there's a lot of different ways to handle it. But I ended up using this relatively simply. Now, what I did do, as you notice, is a very large flap, because this is a large area. Again, I want to be able to get mobility to that flap to be able to close it. There's a cortical cancellous allograft mix. I'll mix putty with cortical chips and cancellous bone. This is all allograft. Place some gem in there, too. Place a bioexclude membrane over that. Usually, I'm going to use two of them for this area, and on top of that, I'm using a double membrane technique. Close that whole area up. This is done at the time of extraction, by the way. And notice that I don't have primary closure. This, this really bothers a lot of people, that I don't get primary closure when I'm doing these big grafts. I do want primary closure if I'm doing ridge augmentation without extraction, but the time of extraction, I'm not gonna do it because I don't want to distort the ridge. And I'll wait in there, I think I waited about nine months. Yeah, here we are at nine months. Take out the screws, and I'm able to place in implants around that area. We're staging this case. We're going to load the implants. Then we're going to take out the two canines. This case is not done, but we've loaded the implants. So here we are before, and here we are at nine months later when the implants go in. But if you look at the bone, it's not completely mature. If you look, at, if I if I look at this bone when I expose this bone in about four or five months, it's going to look, it's going to turn over again. So there's something called sigma. It's about every four months, bone turns over and complete maturation last about a year. Now, Istan Urban, who I've trained with, he doesn't go in until eight to 12 months now. He does not do a lot of immediates. When he places his implant in, he waits another four months. So a lot of his implants are, are, are 16 months after the original graft, by the time he exposes them. So take your time. I'm not in a rush. My patients may be in a rush. If they're in a rush, I'll send them to somebody else. I'll use that patient as a weapon and send them to somebody who I don't like across town. I go, see this guy, see Dr. Jones? Why, he's a nice guy. You know those nice guys that aren't very nice? Okay, that's who Dr. Jones is. I just made that name up, okay? But I am taking my time. I don't want the stress of things failing. So here we are, the implants are uncovered. And then I took out these two teeth, and then we loaded those implants, and I'm, I've actually placed in two more implants, and I'm waiting for the case to be completed. Now, failing implants, we can use regeneration as well. Unfortunately, we're seeing more of them. I talked to a lot of the periodontists at this meeting already, and a lot of people are talking about how do you handle failing implants. Um, I'd like to handle them by extracting them and regenerating the bone because I don't have six to eight months to see if the bone graft's gonna work around the implant and then place another crown onto that area, but the patient really wants to save the implant. 
it becomes a judgment call. Do you want to save the implant? If, if I didn't place it, I don't want to save it. If I placed it, maybe I want to save it. But I usually work more conservatively with my own implants. Scaling root planning, you know, maybe getting underneath there with some laser therapy that probably doesn't make a bit of a difference at all, but I'll use it a little bit. And I'll clean it, maybe I'll shoot some antibiotics in there and see what happens, and then hopefully the patient will die before that implant fails, you know? <laughs> Okay, so this implant is going to be removed. The lady is miserable. This one has to be removed, and you'll see why in a minute. It's, it's not placed in the right angle, and it's not placed in the bone. Um, at least they didn't go into the nerve. I don't know if that would have made much of a difference, but there's, there's 50%, 60% bone loss on the implant. You can see the angle. So the implant is going to be removed, and this is still integrated. As you can see, it's threaded. We'll place bone graft, bioexclude, another membrane, closed it. Again, same, same technique, and I'll come back in there, and in six months, we have bone here. So it's the same, I tried to take the same picture with my comb beam CT scan, and this is relatively good bone in six months. You can see it's relatively dense, and now the implant can go into that area. It's still a challenging case because I've lost papilla on the adjacent teeth, I'm not going to get that back. So I'm going to drill at 75 RPM, place autogenous bone labially, place another bioexclude membrane, and then we'll come back here. I actually did a few other things too. I did a connective tissue graft, which I hate doing, too challenging. Um, I figure if you grow enough bone, you don't need that much connective tissue, but she did need a connective tissue graft. It's not a perfect case, but relatively nice result. You know, we're going straight across here, and now we go high, it's still high. This, I mean, this could be a little lower, but these are about, it's okay. It's not perfect, but I'm very happy with that, and she, she was pleased with it too. This took us a while. Now, how about vertically growing bone around these cases? I have found that now I'm regenerating bone in a vertical manner around some of these bony defects where I didn't think it was possible with such a simple technique. Now, this woman here uh, did not come to the dentist for a while. She's got some calculus on her teeth. This tooth is failing. Um, tooth comes out. You can see like what happened. Look what happened. Here we are. I took this x-ray, and she hadn't been in for a couple years because I'm too expensive. Uh, for profies, but cheap for implants. And so you take out, I don't want to, I don't want to spend the money to get my teeth clean. Okay, well, let's do a regurgitation, a couple of implants, that's cheaper than a profi. So you can see the calculus is in this area here, it's, it just failed, and so we took that tooth out. And you'll see in a second what the defect looked like, it's through and through. Now, I didn't think that this was going to regenerate as well as it did, and I placed some graft material in there with jam in this case, and bioexclude. A little membrane here, but nothing over the top. So I have two membranes here, no membrane here. And what was amazing is she, you know, I came back into that area about eight or nine months later, and it's not perfect, but I got the implant in. I squeezed it in there, utilizing some bone expansions. Did a little sinus bump here, and um, it worked out relatively well. So she is now in the process of being restored. So the last case I'm going to show you um, is this girl here, Lauren. She's a dental student. Uh, very, very attractive young girl, and there were some mistakes in treatment planning. So before I met her, she was, went to, through ortho, and they moved her two laterals um, toward the centrals. So now we have two spots for implants, which is ridiculous. So now we have implant the tooth, implant the tooth, implant the tooth, implant the tooth. If you kept the laterals where they were, you could have put one implant in in the middle, and the implant wouldn't even be close to the tooth, or you could have done one implant with a cantilever, depending upon what you wanted to do. So because of her poor treatment planning, we now have a problem here, but she's got a bigger problem, and that problem is that she's got a paper-thin mandible. So thank you for the referral, young girl in dental school with no bone on a labial here, and Mike, please uh, grow bone, place two implants in that case. So I said, okay, good. And that's what she looks like. You know, so these teeth are ready to fall out. She's only 22 years of age. So she's a uh, fourth year, actually no, she just graduated from dental school. She's two years out of dental school now. So this was done about six years ago. So we did a corticotomy in this area, which we, I do corticotomies for bone regeneration oftentimes without moving teeth, but we can, I do make a lot of perforations in this area. It tends to stimulate, you get the wrap phenomenon. I'm gonna cover that area with the bone graft material. Okay, this is a combination of cortical cancellus and a putty, because I want the stick there, and I'll take two large pieces of bioexclude, cover that area, and then this is human pericardium, and we get primary closure. So we've already thickened everything up at that time, and uh, this is her over the period of time. This is at about two or three weeks. This is maybe about a month. This is about a few months, and this is about six months. Well, actually, no, this is after she's restored. So let me show you the, the x-rays. This is here before, very thin bone, do you want to place an implant in here? Nope. I don't even want to place an implant in here, okay, after we've regenerated it. I regenerate fairly good bone, but still, these, these very thin mandibles, and there are a fair amount of them, 
they're hard to treat. So we go into that area, she still doesn't have a lot of bone, but more than when she started. And I'm gonna give you a comparison in a second. This is where she started. We were able to grow bone up the, the labial aspects of the teeth. We we're able to augment the ridge into that area, create enough bone. I'm able to place two implants here and here, but again, another opportunity to regenerate bone. Place the implants, these are three millimeter, point, four millimeter implants. Bone autogenous bone here, more bio-exclude on the outside. Uh, four growth factors, I mean, it's almost enough bone, but I just want to get a little bit more if I can. The more bone is better. Here she is closed, and here she is at three weeks, two or three weeks. Besides, besides helping the growth factors to regenerate bone, it increases the blood supply to the area, so the healing seems to be a little bit better. And here she is restored, you know, with the two implants and the lateral incisors. And you can see uh, the th increased thickness that we have. These are the two implants here and what she looked like before, you can see the roots are just peeking right through, and now we've covered those. And I just saw her the, oh, about this summer, at about four or five years postoperatively, and she's just about to open up her own dental practice. And she thanked me for her good work. I never told her that the treatment plan wasn't done ideally because these teeth shouldn't have been moved, but um, I probably never will tell her that unless she's sitting in the audience, <laughs> I don't think she is. So I can just summarize. Understand the grafting triad, okay? Regenerate bone as early as possible at the time of extraction. The day you take out a tooth is the first day of implant surgery, whether you place the implant that day or not. Regenerated extractions, I heard a question before. Whether there is an infection or not, I always do a bone graft. Um, consider growth factors, no plate, use a membrane, overbuild, bone growth first, then implant, take your time, file biological principles. And as I promised, I have a little gift for you. If you take a picture of that, this is the first chapter of my book in audio and in PDF. I tried to get Brad Pitt to read it, but he was busy, and then I heard him do a test read, I didn't like it, so I read it myself. It was the hardest thing I ever did. I put my head in the box for three days and read with a microphone this close, eating peanut M&Ms, drinking Diet Coke. That was the good part of it, but I got it done. So um, I hope you enjoy that. And uh, my good friend, Bob Levine, uh, who has been promoting this, which I, I thank him for, and someone who is pr pretty much one of my close brothers in periodontics, and we took our boards together back in 1986, and we've been close friends, said, and he and I practice very similarly. People are at the core of any business model. It's all about treating people, not patients. So uh, thank you, Bob, for that. And if you want to follow me on Instagram, you can go ahead, a little, this is me last week, before I cut my hair. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's a whole other story. And if you come to my lecture on treating people, not patients, I'll talk to you about neuro-linguistic program and changing the way you look. So thank you, and I'll be here for a few questions if you like. Yeah. What do I use multiple membranes? Well, I use bioexclude. Um, not as a membrane when I use multiple. I will use it as a membrane by itself, but when I want to get a tremendous amount of bone, I'll use bioexclude on top of the graft because I think it gives us some growth factors, and I'll place another membrane on top. So I want to, because I don't know if the bioexclude is going to be strong enough to stay there. I don't know how long it's going to stay in that area. Now, the company may disagree with me because they say, well, all you need is the bioexclude, and that's all I need in a small graft. But I, I'm a belt and suspenders guy, so I place the other membrane there. Uh, there are many different types on the market, okay? So I, I tend to use bovine, porcine, or human pericardium. So I'll use a human pericardium. I'll use a porcine membrane that stays around for about four months. I actually had a talk yesterday with Rodrigo Neva, who has a very similar philosophy that I do in terms of grafting. We use a lot of the same products. I don't know if he uses as much bioexclude, but about a lot of the same products. He said, I asked, what's the minimum amount of time you want a membrane to be there so the bone will program to turn to bone? He said four months, but I don't have any data on that. Okay, so because I used to do Gore-Tex membranes, and I keep them in for nine months. I'd take those up. There was a ton of bone, okay? Now, small now there's different types of grafts, and there's different types of membranes. So like BioWAS and BioGuide are used together all the time. Like, you all know that. Why? Well, BioWAS doesn't resorb very quickly. BioGuide is resorbed in a couple months. So you don't need the membrane to be there as long because the graft doesn't resorb. The grafts that I use, which are allograft, will resorb relatively quickly and because they resorb relatively quickly, four months, I want the membrane to stay there about four months. So the membranes that I use, I use a lot of OsteoGuard, and I use the um, Copius Extend, and I use human pericardium. So those are my three membranes. But the BioExclude is used in almost every big graph right now. You know? And uh, I know I'm lecturing for them here, but I, 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 don't, I just show you what I do in my practice. Yes? Well, 
We didn't do it. The case of a dental student, what, what about ortho? Now, if someone's in ortho treatment, I, I do the graft and ortho at the same time, okay? Because you want, you want to be able to have what's called the wrap phenomenon. Because you're moving teeth, you're stimulating the bone, and you're grafting. So we, what the orthodontist usually does is they start to line up the teeth and begin, begin the process. And once they have the bands on, or sometimes we do a lot with Invisalign as well, you know, or our aligners, um, I do the graft, and we just continue immediately with the orthodontic care even if they're moving it labially, yes, but we're not moving it that fast, okay? Not initially. But most of these cases are being moved labially, right? Because they have no labial bone. In her case, there was no ortho done. They were done. They already messed her up. <laughs> and then they sent her in. I go, leave the wires on. I'm gonna graft around the wires, okay? No, those teeth weren't moved after, after that. Any other questions? Do I tack my membranes? Uh, if they are non-resorbable, uh, like a cytoplast membrane, I will tack them. I very rarely tack these. Now, when do I tack? When a membrane is being placed near a muscle attachment, like the mentalis muscle here, or, or deep here when the buccinator's muscle, and I'm worried that the tongue's gonna move it, then I may, may tack it. I do a technique that uh, Rodrigo Neva, again, said, showed yesterday called the lasso technique, where I'll, I'll pick up, I didn't show you any of those today, where I'll pick up the periosteum on the buckle, take it over the membrane, go through the, the, the lingual or palatal tissue and bring it back. So I'll stabilize it that way. Um, I don't think it's as critical to tack, to tack resorbable membranes. And I, none of these were tacked that you saw. I can show you ones that are, but, but none of these were tacked. When you do the uh, procedure, the bone graft, and the Yeah, post-operative uh, treatment, I'll put them on a mouthwash. You're usually, uh, Paradex, you know, Glorexidine. I know a lot of people are using a lot of other uh, mouthwashes now. And then I'll give them a soft toothbrush at two weeks or three weeks. Usually I see them at three weeks. So at three weeks, I give them a soft toothbrush. Depending upon how well they're healing, if, they, if their plaque control is terrible, I'll tell them to continue for another couple of weeks. But I start having on a soft toothbrush then. I see them about four weeks after that. Then I start doing interproximal cleaning. Yes, yes. Um, um, question is, do I use, always use bioexclude and, and, and um, pericardium? At this point, yes. I haven't, I haven't not done it. Maybe at some point I'll just use it on one side and not use it on the, on the other side. Uh, I'm doing some research now with just a bone graft, a growth factor, and collagen, with, you know, and we're getting some pretty good results. That's a belt and suspenders case. I get phenomenal results doing this. I'm afraid to take something out of, out of the formula. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you very, very much. Thanks for the opportunity.